my name is Aoife and I um, run the Design House Styles with Simple and I have been asked to talk to you guys today about some of the basics in interior design. So everything from colour, furniture placement, rugs and artwork. Um, we might not get through everything today, but what we don't get through, um, I will forward the slides on to either Laura or Bethany so that you can have them and at least have the have the content. And we may do a Q&A at some other point as well. Um, but before we get into colour and furniture set out and all that, I want to just talk about interior design and why interior design is important, because there is the kind of the notion out there that interior design is all about um, nice fabrics and cushions and that it's kind of like a la da kind of a thing. But interior design, I think, is really important because we whether we know it or not, when we go into a room, we actually feed off the energy in a room. And I don't mean in terms of like the positive negative energy. I mean, in terms of if a room is really well designed, you might not even notice it. But if a room is quite imbalanced or chaotic, you will notice it. And it's actually going to impact how you are interacting in the space, how you interact with people in the space and how you work in the space or how you relax in, in a space. So for that reason, that's why I think interior design is really important. It, um, it really does make you feel either good or bad or more energized or not energized. Now, of course, interior design is also about creating a lovely home and a space that feels aesthetically pleasing to you and everyone that enters the space. And now we can get on to color. And I think this is one thing that um, people find the hardest within their homes is how to pick a color scheme. Do you go room by room? Do you pick a color scheme for the whole house? And where do you actually start? So there are some basic rules, but they're kind of interior design rules. And I don't really like saying that there are rules in interior design because it's um, quite a creative process. So I feel like it should be more guide. So wherever you see rules there, actually just take it out and just think that it's a guide. It's not a rule because it's not set in stone that you have to do it exactly. It's just a guide to help you when you are picking your color scheme. OK, so the guide that I usually go by is 60, 30, 10. And basically what that means is 60 percent is going to be your base color or your more, most dominant color. 30% is going to be your secondary color. So it's going to be something that's a bit stronger than your base color, but it's not going to be very overpowering or like a pop of color. Your pop of color is going to be your 10%. Now I'm kind of briefly going over it there, but I will be talking about it quite a lot throughout the, the evening. So um, just briefly to kind of explain just an idea, and it's not always the way, it's just sometimes, 60% um, could be, let's say, your walls. And it usually would be for a neutral base color, would be a lot of the walls would be in your neutral. It can be accent pieces. It can be larger items like your rug or your sofa. Uh, so larger foundation pieces. Uh, your 30% then would be some, something like, let's say, it could be your curtains. It could be an accent wall or a feature wall. It could be smaller furniture, it could be side accent chairs or side chairs and basically your smaller furniture items. And then your 10%, that's where you're going to bring in through your cushions, your trolls, your fabrics, your decorative accessories and your artwork. But again, this is a guide. You could also have a secondary um, colour in your artwork. It doesn't have to be exactly like this. I'm just breaking it down like this to kind of help give you some kind of a formula when you are picking your colors. OK, so basically how we use it. OK, so 60 percent is going to be your primary color or your base hue. So this is going to be your most dominant color in your room or your house. This can be something that is a neutral color or if you were to design a room that was more of a moody interior, it could be quite a dark color. For me, the 60% is always a neutral color because that's what my style is. I like to have my base quite neutral and then bring in different character, um, character and aesthetics through texture and small elements of color. But if you wanted to use that 60% as a dominant color, a dark, like honestly, like a navy or something like that, you can do it. It just basically is the color that is going to be represented most in your home or your room. 
So then your 30% is the secondary color in the space. So this is going to be something that is supporting your primary color. So it's not going to be something that's very, very strong, but it's different enough that you can see quite a bit of depth and difference and interest between the two colors. So if you think a neutral soft gray next to a, ta a tan leather, that would be an idea of a primary and your secondary colors. And then again, your 10% is your accent color or your fun color, your pop of color. Okay, so to explain this even more, and I hope that you're understanding it and that it's not getting boring now, but this is my old apartment in Cork that I'm really missing right now because one, it had very good internet and two, it had an amazing view and it was really cute. But anyways, in this apartment, 60% or the base hue is the overall color. And in this room, it was the wall color and it was the sofa. Then my 30% was my secondary hue which was the tan leathers in the armchair here. You could see it throughout the rest of the interior as well, but this is just an example there that it's not a huge amount of the space, but it is adding in that element of depth and interest in space. Okay, so then the last 10% is the accent. And for what I went with was the pops of blue and different shades of blue. So you can see this here in the little cushion. You can also see there kind of, that there is actually elements of blue in that artwork and also the throw here. And if you have a look here, this rug that I actually, I just loved it, had elements of blue as well. Um, so you can see that throughout the interior, there actually is quite a lot of elements of the blue, but it's not something that you would go in and it's really, really striking. It's the only thing you see, but all of the elements of blue that have been put in there, they've been taught, there's a reason they've been put there. They're working with the overall color scheme. Um, okay, so that's how I did it with my apartment. So I'm going to now go through how you guys can do it in your own home. So where do you start? So you start basically with your base color or your neutral. Um, this is a question that I get asked a lot as well is what's a good white, what's a good neutral? Because if you get them right, they're amazing. If you get them wrong, especially in the Irish weather and the gray hues that we naturally get, um, it can, it's really important to get them right. So I basically just rounded up a few of my favorite ones that you can take away with you and why they are my favorites. Um, so I recommend them to clients all the time. Um, I use them all the time. And so I think that they'd be good tips for you guys. So the first one is Arctic Blonde and this is by Color Trend. So again, this could be one of your 60% or your base color. Um, the reason I like this color so much is because it has the perfect amount of creaminess and white in one so that in Irish homes, it's still really fresh, really warm without it being too clinical. So it doesn't have like that, like that hospital feel when you walk in, even though all the walls are white here, it's still very warm and cozy. Um, and then the next one is White Horse. So this is a color that I've just started using and it's from Dulux. So I actually just used this in a house that myself and Barry were looking at in Limerick. And the reason I like it so much is because it has nice elements of white in it. There are gray undertones, so it's a more contemporary color. So beautiful color, but I would only suggest using it in, let's say, a south facing room because it does have those kind of bluey gray undertones. So nice for a contemporary look, but have to be careful where you do where you use it, you need to be getting a lot of natural light going into the space. Um, Subtle uh, is a colour that I'm always recommending to people. It's just really, really good in Irish homes. Again, it's from Colour Trend. Um, it's a soft grey, but it is built on undertones of beige. So it's actually really warm and earthy. Um, it's actually the colour that we used in our apartment in Cork. It's not too grey that it has too much of a blue feeling or drawn feeling. It is a nice earthy hue, but it's it's not too dark either that it's kind of going on the taupe color. So it's a color that I always recommend and I really like. 
And then the last color is oyster bed. Now this color is actually in the same family as subtle because again, I really like them. And um, the from color trend again, it's just two levels darker than subtle. So if you're looking for a gray that has warm undertones and warm beige hues, this one is perfect. Um, and it's again, it's a bit more earthy. So you can see here, it looks a lot more gray than subtle did in my apartment. So it is that definite gray, but it's still quite warm. So here it's pa paired with blue hues, which are naturally cold, but that interior doesn't look cold. It still looks cozy and warm, which is really important again for Irish homes. So those are some options in picking your base color. Um, and then that can kind of, once you get the right neutral to work with, that can nearly be the easiest part because you know that 60%, so your larger areas in your home are going to be colored in your base hue. So then you need to find out how are you going to pick the rest of your color scheme. So there's a few ways that you can do this, but the first step I would do is determine what you're stuck with. Now that's not a bad thing that you know, items that you don't want. It's not like that at all. It could be an item that's really important to you. It could be that you're moving into a home that already has flooring that you obviously, you don't want to ignore it and just pretend it's not there. You need to work with it. Um, and when you do get these items, it actually is going to give you a little bit of a step forward and picking the rest of your color scheme. So going back to my apartment, what I did was, um, Obviously I was in a rental, so let's say the flooring, I wasn't getting rid of. I had to work with that flooring. The light unfinished sideboard was something that I wanted to keep. It was just really, really good for storage. So I wanted to work with that color, uh, color way. And also the dining table was a light unfinished wood that I wanted to work with. And then the last thing, oh my God, that's my little dog's tush actually there. <laughs> um, the last thing then was, um, a rug that I had had for years. So when we were redesigning the apartment, I knew I wanted to keep it because I loved it. So again, it's not that these must keeps are things that you don't want. They are must keeps also because you want them. So after you have figured out your must keeps, you want to look at what your inspirational piece is going to be. So this can be anything. It can be artwork. It can be a rug. It can be just an important item. It could be a photograph. It could be a view. It really can be anything that you draw inspiration from. So let's say in uh, my apartment, I was drawing inspiration from the rug because again, I just liked the way there was quite a lot of different hues within the rug. And um, I liked that there was quite an element of that pop of blue without it being too much. So I started looking at that for my color inspiration. So I saw that there was nice hints of warm grays. There was some of the tan hues and kind of biscuity hues. And there was lots of different shades of blue from darker blues to lighter blues. Um, so again, this is just kind of going through your base color. So again, the base color, 60% can be anything from your whites, your creams, your tans, your grays, um, or if you want it to be a dominant color and a more moody interior, it could even be a navy. So this is going to be again for your walls and your bigger furniture items. Once you have this um, color and you add your two other secondary and third color, it won't feel too neutral. It'll have a lot of depth um in the interior so let's say for the secondary color this is going to be something again that's 30 percent of the interior um i started looking at the tan leathers because i saw those biscuit hues within the rug and so i wanted to start bringing that out in different areas of the interior so that's what drew me to getting the tan um, armchair then the accent color so again that's the third color that's the little bit of fun, a little bit of a pop um, that kind of ties everything together. So I was working with, again, the blues, um, just adding little accents throughout the interior in the artwork, in the cushions, again, the rug um, to make it a little bit more cohesive and tie it together a bit more. Um, so then um, instead of just talking about the apartment, I wanted to kind of show different um, client renders where that uh, formula is used in the 60, 30, 10. So let's say in this interior, you're just seeing one back wall there 
of the uh, neutral color, but the interior, all of the walls are in that neutral color. And so that would be your base color. Um, I've used the tan leathers here, which are also linked in the flooring, which would be your 30%. And then the little accents are the greens here in the dining chairs. And they're also linked in the greenery, which is scattered throughout the space. So again, this is just the other side of the interior. You can see that the neutral 60% is kind of the more dominant color and it's going throughout the interior. And then we have the little accent of the green on the feature wall, which is also linked in the rug here. And then we have the secondary color in the tan leather, the hide, and also a little bit in the flooring as well. Um, so I'm going to move on to how you can link your colors in um, different areas of your home. Um, so the first um, area that I would be looking at is this neutral dining area. So if you just kind of ignore down here for the minute and we just look at the dining area, it's really neutral. There's lovely texture, let's say, with the dining table and the chairs, but there's not too much else going on. So what I want to kind of show you is just an example on how you could link a color scheme to this area. So down here um, is the living area color scheme, which I'll show you in just a second. So we have some really nice mustard yellows. We have some velvet um, emerald greens and um, we've some linen hues and we have some brass. And what I want to do is link this color scheme, which is in the living area, to the dining area. So this would be really important, let's say in an open plan area where you don't want um, too many, you don't want the living area to be too different from the dining area because they are within the same space. So the way I would, there's lots of different ways that you can link it. You could do it through the sea chain or you could do it, through, do it through a rug. But the easiest way and the most economical way that I find to link a color scheme is, let's say if you have an armchair in a living room, that's that really nice green. I would look at getting artwork that has those elements of green in it. So work in it, it could also be a vase or something like that, little decor items that aren't going to cost an arm and a leg. And also they're not going to be too difficult to change in the future if you decide I'm over green, I don't want it anymore. You can change it quite easily. So I've linked the green here through the artwork. I've also linked those really nice brass hues in the artwork here and here. And then the linen hues are linked through the artwork here and they're also linked in it here and here. So what that's going to do is create this dining space that has a link to the color scheme in the living room without it being too much um, and also without it being really restrictive that you can't really change it in a few months or in a few years if you want it. Um, that is actually it on color. If anyone wants to ask questions. <laughs> All right, that was great. Thanks so much, Eva. Yeah, I just just to pick up on a couple two things that I think I'm going to go away with today is um, just that easy formula. It seems like if we can all go away thinking in terms of picking colors, you just do your your sixty, your thirty, and your ten, and that way the room is going to be yeah. tied together. I love that. And then the other thing that I really loved was the idea of the muskies, because it's a little bit. It's not saying you have to get everything new. And it, as you said, it could be an item that you love or it could be an item that you're kind of left with that's in the property already that might be like the kitchen flooring or such. Absolutely. You can it's still always... tie that in. Yeah, and I think that's, because it's one thing I find that um, my clients do a lot. They kind of, not ignore it, but they kind of try to forget about it. But it's like, but it's there. Like you have to incorporate it somehow. Um, and the must keeps as well, I don't think that they should always be like this the whole thing of everything being new. That doesn't make it better. Do, do you know what I mean? We all have those things that we want to keep. So we should be able to incorporate them. And it's very easy to incorporate them. You just think about it. Yeah. Before you start with your new scheme. Fantastic. Thanks, Aoife. Yeah. I can, would a navy color be too dark for a small hallway? Oh, no, like it really depends how bold you want to be. Do you know what I mean? Like navy <laughs> hallways can be super, super cute, but it really depends on how much light is getting into them. Like I'm just thinking now, like if you had navy on the walls, maybe one wall had like navy wallpaper and like a really cute pattern tile, like that would be a really out there design, but very cute. 
Okay. Very good. And in your hallway as well, it would be about kind of creating the ambience. So if you're going navy, you want to create a really nice ambience with, let's say, wall lights, um, table lights, things like that, so that in the evening when it is kind of darker, that you can ha still oh, yeah. have those warm hues. Okay. So it's more about. So I guess, sorry, you can do it, but yeah, you have to have the lighting as well. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. Like, it depends how bold you want to go. Excellent. I would say go for it, look. <laughs> go for it with some nice lighting. Denise says, yes. great. Thank you, Eva. Okay, guys, I think I think I think we should move on to our next topic. I think that's that seems to be all the questions there. And uh just time wise, let's scooch on. Okay, perfect. Um okay, so the next um topic that I'm talking about is furniture placement tips and best layout. Um, again, I'm just talking about them in a really broad sense because obviously I don't have any AutoCAD or layout uh, programs with me that I can show you and it would get really complicated as well. But I've kind of broke it down to hopefully make it make sense and easy. Uh, so the first thing you want to do for any room is you want to determine what the function of the room is, which sounds really basic, but we'll go through it anyway. So let's say for a living room, the usual function is entertainment and relaxing. So with the fact that the function is entertainment and relaxing, that's actually going to tell us what type of furniture we need in the space. So we, for entertainment and relaxing, it means that you want to create some nice conversational areas. So things like seating are going to be really, really important. Um, places where people can sit down, relax, chit chat. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so the next um, topic that I'm talking about is furniture placement tips and best layout. Um, again, I'm just talking about them in a really broad sense because obviously I don't have any AutoCAD or layout uh, programs with me that I can show you and it would get really complicated as well. But I've kind of broke it down to hopefully make it makes sense and easy. Uh, so the first thing you want to do for any room is you want to determine what the function of the room is, which sounds really basic, but we'll go through it anyway. So let's say for a living room, the usual function is entertainment and relaxing. So with the fact that the function is entertainment and relaxing, that's actually going to tell us what type of furniture we need in the space. So we, for entertainment and relaxing, it means that you want to create some nice conversational areas. So things like seating are going to be really, really important. Um, places where people can sit down, relax, chit chat. And things like storage, although they're important in a living room, they're not going to be as important as your sofa and your armchairs. They're going to trump your storage as opposed to, let's say, a playroom. A playroom is um, a room that you need a lot of organization and you need to conceal a lot of little messes. So with that, you are going to be looking at more types of furniture that have multiple purposes in terms of organization and storing and concealing messes in, as opposed to seating. You may have one little accent chair in there, but it's more about the um, concealing messes and storing toys and all this kind of stuff. So for example, in a playroom, I find a built-in bench is really handy because you do have a bit of seating in there, but then if you have the option to put storage in there, it's just great for throwing toys in and uh, concealing messes. So that's just an example of how two rooms can have two very different functions. And that means it's going to change what type of furniture you need in the space which is gonna be the first part of your layout. So when you are looking for the best layout in the space, you want to start with the larger furniture pieces first. So let's say I am obsessed with rugs and go on about them quite a bit because they take up the largest surface area, but I'm gonna talk about rugs a little bit later because um, I think there's quite a bit with them. So let's say after rugs in terms of different rooms and a rug can be put in any room, even if you have carpet, but for your bedroom, obviously, it's going to be the largest item is going to be your bed. So that's going to be your most important item in the living room. It's usually going to be your sofa and in the dining area or the dining room, it's going to be the dining table. So let's say we have a rug because we know they're very important. Um, 
and you are going to add, let's say, your largest furniture item, which is going to be your sofa, that's actually going to give you an indication in your room on where your supporting items are going to be placed. So let's say you have your sofa. You're then going to add your supporting items, which could be your coffee table, your accent chairs and your side tables. But you're always going to start with your sofa, your largest item and build around it. And then let's say for a living room specifically, you're also going to, so you have your most your largest furniture item, which is your sofa. We also want to identify what your focal point is, which can be different for different people. But this is going to be anything you want your furniture um, to be placed in front of and facing and looking at. So in some rooms, that's going to be a television, or sorry, in some living rooms, that's going to be a television going to be a fireplace and then in other for other clients they absolutely do not want the furniture focused at the tv they want conversational areas or they want the furniture to be looking at a really nice view or something like that so it really depends on what you want in the space where your focal point is going to be um and with that as well in any living room let's say if you do have your furniture looking at the TV, you still want it to be a place that there's going to be conversational areas. So it's just always one that you have to think of for a living room. So some standard um, and typical conversational layouts would be two sofas across from each other. Um, if you have the space, adding two armchairs to the side, kind of creating a U shape would be a, another kind of typical layout. Um, L-shaped sofa, which is really nice because it's really nice with families as well. It's quite casual um, and two armchairs. So all of those have seating um, across from each other where conversational areas are um, created. So, so this is an example of two sofas across from each other. Again, you can see it's um, an easy place for conversations to happen. That's an example of adding, if you have the space, adding the two armchairs, we're, we're creating a U shape. Again, creating areas that um, are good conversational areas as well. And then this is your option with the L shaped sofa and then adding two or even one armchair accent chair across for it. Again, just that it's easy um, to have a conversation with uh, the person opposite you. Once you think of all these things as well in your layouts, um, it's actually going to make the room more comfortable for people to sit in and relax in. So it's actually going to make it used more. Uh, always with every room as well, you need to be mindful of traffic flow. So you just want to be mindful of your where people are going to enter the room and exit the room and that you're not blocking them ever. <laughs> um, okay, so for the bedroom then to try and get the best layout for the bedroom, what I usually do is use the bed as your focal point and it's the where you kind of create your first impression when you're walking into the room. Um, so again, your bed location is very important. When you walk into the room, you want it to be the first thing you see. Um, usually that's on the opposite wall, but then also in other rooms, um, there could be multiple wall options. So I'm just kind of going to go through some um, bedroom or bed locations in bedrooms that work and don't work. So this doesn't work here because yes, you see it when you walk in, but it's the first thing that you see and you're walking directly onto your bed. So with that, you're actually blocking off your line of sight. You are visually making the room look smaller. You don't even, when you walk in, you wouldn't even see this, you would just see the bed. Whereas if you move it over here, it's increasing the line of sight to the bed. So you still have it as your main focal point, but you also have visually made the space a lot bigger because if you're standing here, walking into the room, you can see it a lot clearer. Okay, so another example of what works and what doesn't work. So again, when you walk into a bedroom, you do want to have the bed um, to be the first visual you see, but you never want to be walking directly onto it. You want the bed to be moved over just slightly that you're kind of giving yourself a bit of space around the bed and also um, giving that line of sight a bit of clearance as well. 
Um, so usually the, if you kind of if you do work with those layouts, the do's and don'ts, um, you are going to create that really nice first impression. And it also naturally always gives you a much better walkway and traffic flow throughout the space. Um, so in your bedroom, once you have your bed picked, the next thing you want to do is create symmetry. So you have your bed picked and you have your bed location, I should say, picked. So the next thing you want to do is really simply to add symmetry to a room or to a bedroom is two uh, nightstands, two table or two nightstands, uh, two table lamps, artwork on top or mirror. And at the side here, if you wanted to go a bit quirky, adding mirrors would look lovely or you could just leave it. And that's going to create really nice symmetry on your first visual when you walk into a bedroom. To finish it off, I always say add a rug um, with carpet or without. And if you wanted to add a little bed bench as well, that's going to be another way to just finish it off very nicely. Um, so the dining area and the best layouts um, and things to think about with a dining area. Basically with a dining area, your biggest decision is going to be the table shape. And there's actually different types of meanings for uh, different shapes. And they can, like what I was saying at the very, very start, that um, an interior can impact your mood and how you feel the shape of a dining table. It sounds really silly, but it really can. Um, so let's say for a square or rectangle dining table, that's usually going to be a much more formal setting. Really, really good for um, fitting a lot of people around it. Um, a round or an oval, they are actually one of my favorite to go with because they're great space savers. So really, really good for open plan areas. And they're kind of more of a casual atmosphere, uh, which I really like. And then some basic sizes with dining tables would be a four person would be 120 centimeters. Six person is usually 150 to 180. Eight person is 240 and 10 person is three meters. When you are selecting your dining table as well, a few things that you want to think about again is your traffic flow throughout the space. So you want to make sure that between the end of the dining table and the wall or anything like that, um, you want to leave at least 120 centimeters up to 180, just that there's easy um, traffic flow throughout the dining space. And oh, that's it on the... Um, <laughs> on the layouts. Perfect. So once you have your color and your layouts, you kind of start thinking about, let's say, your decor. Um, again, I always go on about rugs. I think that they're very, very important. They take up a lot of the visual space. Um, they are also really important for actually grounding the furniture. Um, they make a, and, and therefore make a room an interior feel more established and grounded. And I feel like they are absolutely necessary in studio apartments or open plan areas purely because they zone and they section off areas. So if you have an open plan area with the KLD kitchen, living, dining, I would always suggest having a rug, a large area rug, at least in the living area, that it has that it's sectioned off, it's zoned, and it just, again, it makes it feel more established as a different area in um, an open plan space. So just some do's and don'ts with rugs. Um, you want to try have all your legs of your furniture on the rug and allow at least 150 millimeter space around the rug. So let's say from the back of your chair or your sofa, if it's not up against the wall or side tables, so that it's uh, comfortable to walk around and it's not a trip hazard. Um, what you can also do um, in smaller spaces or if you have a sofa let's say up against the wall here, uh, you can have the front legs of each piece of furniture on the rug. So again that's just going to make it that it's grounded with the rug and it's not going to look disjointed. A thing that I see clients do all the time and it's just not right. <laughs> is having a rug that's too small and right in oh. the center and the only thing on it is a coffee table. This basically makes the space look really disjointed and 
it kind of gives this like island look on the coffee table, which just doesn't work. It's much better designed if you have all your furniture that is meant to be with that rug on the rug. Um, so for the dining area, uh, also a really good place to think of having a rug, especially if you Oh no. Oh no, she's back, is she? Or juice, or you oh, yeah, can get indoor outdoor rugs that are they're really fantastic for dining areas and actually really handy if you um have children um because they are easily cleaned. So with and again in open plan areas, they're just really nice to section off a space and kind of give an otherwise quite open space feel just a little bit more intimate in certain areas. So some simple rules with your rug in a dining area is having all the feet of your furniture on the rug. So obviously you wouldn't have, let's say, just the front two because that's going to cause another trip hazard. Um, so giving yourself about 20 centimetres or more between the um, dining table or chair from the rug, the end of the rug is usually what uh, people would advise and then giving yourself 30 centimeters or more around the end of the rug or the perimeter of the rug to the wall so that it's again easy to uh, walk around the space again what you don't want to do is have the rug too small um this is going to cause a trip hazard and it just never looks right <laughs> mm -hmm. um so then for your bedroom just a few uh do's and don'ts again um having the rug that it's 30 centimeters or more from the end of the bed uh, to the end of the rug. So again, just giving yourself enough space that you can walk on the rug, that your feet, when you get out of the bed, they're not, let's say, half on the rug and half on the floor. You want to actually be able to walk on the rug. Um, you also, with your nightstands, having about 20 centimetres or more between the nightstand and the rug is important just for opening and closing. Um, if you don't want to do that and you have a really lovely large rug, you can obviously bring the rug right up to the wall here and just have it that the full nightstand is on it as well. That works really well too. Again, um, what you don't want to do is have the rug too small. It just doesn't work, it looks too disjointed. Um, so a good size for a bedroom for a rug would be about a 2.3 or 2.4 by 1.6, which I actually see clients a lot of the time, they bring that into their living room, which is much too, it's way too small. It's usually a good size for a bedroom. So the last section is wall art. Um, again, I've just gone through some simple do's and don'ts with wall art. Um, one of the main things that I see clients do is they hang their artwork too high or they hang, let's say, in a gallery wall or an area that they have two prints, they hang them too far apart. So I'm just showing some simple tips with more numbers <laughs> um, on hanging your art. So let's say if you have a dresser like this here or you have even a sofa, um, you want to hang your art between 10 centimetres and 20 centimetres away from the surface of the furniture. That is not that large. Like if you think like a standard wall is about 100 millimetres, so it's like something like this. It's really not that, that far away from it at all. Um, with a sofa, I would say 20 centimetres because you do want it a little bit further away. But I can guarantee if you are trying this tip at home, you will be hanging your picture and being like, that interior designer has no idea what she's talking about. That's way too close to the furniture. Just hang it, try it, trust me, it works. It's <laughs> the right size. Because um, hanging them too far away from your furniture, like with not getting the right rug, it makes it look disjointed. This does not look like it's part of the overall frame that we want to create with the furniture piece, whereas this does. Mm. Um, so then let's say if you don't have a furniture piece and you're hanging your artwork or your frames or even a mirror or anything like that from um, just on its own on a wall, um, there's a few different things that you can do. The general rule or guide is that it's eye level. Um, I'm like five foot. Some people are like way taller. So that's kind of a hard one to decide between as well. So there is a magic number that people use a lot and it's between 145 centimetres to 155 centimetres 
from the floor to the center of the artwork. So let's say this was the art piece that I would say, okay, let, let's have that being eye level and the more prominent or dominant piece. So it's from the center, it's not from the bottom, it's not from the top, from the center of the artwork. And then generally most people, this will be about eye level to them. Um, like that as well, hanging your frames too far apart is something that I see people do quite a bit. Um, oops, sorry now. Um, and again, it's just about making a space look connected and not look disjointed. If you hang your artwork too far away from, uh, your prints too far away from each other, it's going to make it look disconnected and disjointed. So that's the same in a gallery wall as well. You want to hang them between seven to 15, 20 centimeters apart. Um, so again, when you're hanging it, you might think this is way too close. It's not, it really should be quite close to each other. And um, guys, I think that's actually it. I can't believe I flew through those slides, look. <laughs> so I think we're gonna, we're gonna move to a wrap up. Um, so I just wanna say thank you so much Aoife for coming along and I've, I've definitely learned a lot um, and I love that it was so not practical. And I love the examples and the measurements and stuff. 